Hello, everybody, and welcome to another installment of the latest Shiny podcast. Uh, today, I am your host. Uh, Stephen is out, but we have a special guest. I'm very excited. Mark Teeley is here. He is the Chief Strategy Officer of Absera, um, longtime friend, and he and I get together and geek out about technology, about culture, about just about anything. Um, we have a lot of fun. So having Mark on the podcast uh, seems like a natural fit. You are our official first guest. So, Mark, thank you. Oh, a uh, pleasure to be here, Rob. I'm, I'm thrilled to be on your show. I, uh, I couldn't think of anyone more that I'd like to spend some time uh, talking about this stuff with. I, feeling is mutual. We, we have a lot of fun. Um, some of the, some of the, the pre-show uh, work, you and I were having some great conversations, and it's almost a shame we can't rewind. We'll try to um, and, and pull things back. Um, Boy, I, I, before I dive into tech, I, we, we have to pause for a second um, and just, you know, reflect a little bit on some of the, the crazy, you know, storms and shootings and um, uh, misbehavior that's been going on. Um, you and I talk about culture and culture stuff all the time together. You have a short comment. Do you want to uh, lay out a uh, yeah. thought on that? Uh, you know, it, it's it's hard to think of uh, something that's short when you you know you you brought up an amazing, <laughs> yeah. complex and and powerful um, area of conversation, right? I mean, uh, living in Vegas, of course, the recent events here have been um, at a minimum sobering and um, and extremely saddening. I mean, virtually everyone in Vegas knew of someone who was there, or someone, uh, or was directly related to someone that was there. Uh, and in many cases, people that were wounded or um, killed at the event. And, um, uh, you know, it, even including myself, I had a distant relative there that got wounded. I had no idea she was even there. Um, my wife uh, has a coworker who one of his best friends was killed during the event. Um, you know, so it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible, incredibly sad event, but it's also... Um, and I, I don't really want to try to tie this together with everything else we're seeing, but, you know, going back to our, our pre podcast kind of warm up conversation and talking about things like um, hiring equality and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, sustainability is that we can little afford um, today to entertain the notion that uh, some of us are different from the other. And, um, Yes. We need to find a better way to work together. And, and we are failing miserably right now. And, and I would add, thinking through um, the Harvey Weinstein news, we also have to find a way to protect each other. Um, it, 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 the whole thing makes me sad, but it makes me sad to think of people who, um, you know, coming forward now, years and years later, um, you and I have talked about uh, creating, creating, sustainable environments where people can actually, you know, be themselves and, and not be subject to the type of predatory behavior. And we, right. we need to fix so much. I mean, it's a, it's a sombering way to start, but you know, there's so much going on. It, it, I don't want to jump into uh, latest shiny tech, um, yeah. even though that's our subject matter without acknowledging um, you and I both have very deep conversations about these things. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's, I think, yeah, I think it's only fair. Yeah. Um, so, so with that, um, I, you know, I think of all the things we're talking about, you know, you did this, this great post, um, and we'll make sure it gets included in the, in the, uh, notes about, you know, public cloud likely, not like being likely to exceed 17% of IT demand by 2022. Um, I want to unpack that with you before we do, there's a, there's sort of this winners, losers, uh, filter we like to put on things in a lot of cases. Yep. Um, can you talk about this, the, the winners and losers mentality a little bit? And, and that might help us frame the broader discussion here. Yeah, you know, and I, I think there's a couple of different ways I could um, frame the answer uh, to that question. And you know, I, think, I think in some cases, uh, people just like the idea of winners and losers, right? They like the idea that they're going to be working for whoever it is that's going to win um, and that somebody else as a result will lose. Um, and you know, in, in many other cases, it's just a factor of uh, the assumption that in order for me to convince others that my service is what they should be attempting to focus on as their next um, 
opportunity space, um, uh, you know, is, is to throw a little fear out there about the fact that, well, if you don't do it now, you're going to be left behind because we're the only ones that are doing the right thing. Um, and, you know, that in, in a big way, you see those scenarios play out across the, uh, um, the landscape of uh, internal IT or, you know, private data centers, uh, co-location uh, and uh, wholesale hosting and um, cloud or, you know, SaaS offerings or even HPC offerings. And I think the reason that I did the blog was uh, at least twofold, maybe three or four um, major themes there. But the, the first theme was really to show that it doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter how hard you scream. Everybody that's doing something right in the spaces that I um, covered are likely to win over the next five years and not just win, but win considerably and, and not at the risk of growing slower, not at the risk of falling behind, but win just because of the law of sheer numbers um, as I see it moving forward. And, and um, so, you know, to me, that's both exciting and, and eye opening, right? So part of what you're saying is not that there's going to be a loss of share, right? You had mentioned earlier, you know, public cloud is growing by 3x or even bigger. It's, it's not that. It's, it's everybody's growing together. It's so a relative share percentage that is, is actually can be really hard to move if everybody's growing. From that That's right. That's right. I mean, my, my assumption, and this could be, you know, a whole conversation all, of it, all in and of itself, is when you look at the different trends that are affecting what will become of IT, uh, and, and when I say IT, I'm, I'm really talking about everything that is technology oriented that requires um, you know, engineers and coders and people that um, rack and stack hardware and build networks, et cetera. So that could be the engineering organization that works for PayPal or Facebook, or it could be the IT organization that works for Walmart, or it could be the IT organization, which is not called an IT organization, that does Walmart online, right? As far as I'm concerned, that is all IT. Facebook is a giant IT organization. eBay is a giant IT organization. So as we move forward and we think about these trends that are hitting us, those trends, which include things like, uh, you know, connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles in general, or, or drone technology, or VR, and I, uh, AI and ML, and IoT. <laughs> oh, we just went way deep in it. I know, okay. I know. And even, even cloud itself, right? If you think about all these trends, the potential for, um, well, well, I'm just going to throw something out there. Maybe yeah. not everybody agrees with this, but that the vast, the biggest reason for chasing things like VR and IoT has, uh, while there are lots of cool reasons like making machines run more efficiently and gathering new data about uh, how an office building operates or a manufacturing line operates, one of the biggest drivers for these technologies is getting closer to the customer. Right. So what, is, what does that point to? That points to companies transitioning to a more technology-focused organization similar to a PayPal or an eBay. And I expect that over the next five years to mean that we will double the landscape of technology being consumed in the world over the next five years. Right. I, I suspect double is actually modest, right? If, if container technology is making it faster to develop, deploy, right? If we're actually improving efficiency, then, you know, demand, is, demand for more capability is going to be grow even faster than that. Um, that, Absolutely. that's pretty clear, but there's, yeah. but it, it can't go that fast, right? What's, right. what's our bottleneck? What, where's the bottleneck in this, right? It's not the amount of silicon that, uh, Intel and AMD, uh, and the arm consortium can, can pump through the system. Um, it, I, that doesn't feel like the limit for no, me. No, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that Intel and HP and, and, um, Quanta and, and organizations like that could build enough servers if they wanted to and, and if there were people ready to buy them. I think some of the um, things that will bottleneck are, are really, I mean, legacy IT will bottleneck to some degree in mm -hmm. the sense that even if a company or let's say, let's say, you know, every company and when, when I say every company, of course, there's no every in IT. So let's say 70 or 80 percent of companies in the world decided they all wanted to move their um, operations into public cloud. You know what that would mean if it, let's just say they had a five year window to do that. You know what that would mean to public cloud growth? You know what that would mean? I mean, they're, they're at 10% today. 
so if they got, and, and if all of what's in internal IT moved to the public cloud in the next five years, or even 60% of it moved in the next five years, that would mean that these guys would have to grow 10 to 12 X between now and 2022, because the total market, total addressable market in 2022 will likely be, as we talked about, double or more what it is today. Can you imagine? That doesn't even account for growth, right? That's right. That's right. That's what I'm saying. So can you, can you imagine these guys going from what I quoted as, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 million servers in the public cloud space today? Can you imagine them growing to 140 or 150 million servers, just, which is more than the entire world had <laughs> two years ago? Right. <laughs> I do. I do think we're in for a refresh and and, and create some some density improvements. But, but yeah. it's it's a huge, it's a stunning challenge. Um, just from a from a growth perspective, I think it's also, you know, people are, are starting to realize just how complex some of these cloud migrations are, especially when they start consuming a lot of services. Right. You had mentioned the word legacy, um, and uh, you know. Legacy, in a lot of cases, means highly interconnected to other systems, right? That's what makes legacy so hard and brittle and, and difficult to move. Yep. Um, you know, I, I know, you know, we, we really haven't talked at all about what Sarah's doing in, in this space. Um, we, you know, you and I love to jump right into the, the future stuff um, and, and sort of the big, the big picture, big picture things. Um, but how do we, how do we address not walking, how do we, pay down some of the debt we've got in these interconnected fragile systems that are snowflaked on in, in individual data centers and not walk back into that space, um, either in, on premises infrastructures or in cloud. You know, how do we, how do we get, avoid that trap? Yeah. Yeah. There, there, I don't know that there's a simple answer. I mean, from a, oh, from darn a, it. <laughs> I know, I know from a, from a strategy standpoint, I would argue that, um, uh, what we all need to do is not assume that because we're doing something different that the results will end up different than what the results have been over the last 15 or 20 years of IT ownership. So and rubbing containers on things doesn't magically take away interdependency pains? It doesn't take away interdependency pains. It doesn't take away the risk of um, having fragmented, um, as a friend of mine, Ralph Laura at uh, uh, RNF likes to say, uh, creating the Winchester Mystery House of IT. We have, <laughs> we have, yeah, we have just as much risk of doing that in modern IT and finding ourselves locked into a set of pathways that we have a hard time getting ourselves out of. Um, small rooms, big rooms, rooms that have half a door, um, uh, rooms that connect to other rooms that they shouldn't connect to and we don't know about. And that's a problem that we can create even more quickly in modern infrastructure than we could in the past. And so if we're not careful and strategic about how we make that tra this transition, we could find ourselves six or seven years later with the same concern all over again. And that's when, when I think about some of what I've learned about Upsara, that's one of the, the intentional governance of interconnect. Um, and I, you know, I'm not sure you would describe it the same way, but one of the things that, what, that I paid attention to, um, it was interesting to me is, is sort of that thinking process. On, on knowing what you're connected to. Yeah, I mean, control. realistically, you know, to, to put um, Rackin and, and Absera in the same page from a theme standpoint, it's, it's the ability to make IT more effectively consumable, um, to make, uh, and by making it more consumable, that means that you're putting yourself in a position to be able to be more flexible with how you use IT, when you get rid of IT, and what IT you decide to use. And when I say IT, I mean, I'm talking about anything. It could be a cloud service, it could be a, uh, hardware as a service, it could be networking services, makes no difference. Um, but your ability to acquire effectively and easily um, integrate that with the appropriate um, governance and policy that you need for your workloads, and then to be able to disengage as, as needed um, is important for all of us. And, you know, like I I'm, I'm want to say, and I think you and I have probably said this to each other a couple of times in the past, is that what we're facing going forward um, is not solved by throwing more bodies and hardware at the problem, right? Which is just another simpler way of saying what I was saying before. Um, we, need, we need to rethink this process and we need to think about the fact that if, if I'm looking my CFO or my CEO or my CIO in the eye and I'm saying, okay, where do we need to head to? 
I need to be thinking the same things that the guys at Google and Facebook were thinking in the first two years of operation when they're like, okay, we can't just continue to hire a hundred engineers every day to handle our new server. <laughs> right. We've got to do this differently. Right. And that, that's where I get excited about automated pipelines, small iterations, breaking, you know, breaking quickly. Um, Cause that's really the, the real answer for this is, you know, the faster you find out that you have a dependency because you broke it, um, or the earlier in the process you find out that there's a dependency that, you, that you're attached to, um, the, the more resilient your, your IT is going to be, the, 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 the less effort it's going to take. It's these very bespoke systems where nobody really knows exactly how they're configured. Those are incredibly expensive to maintain. Um, you know, every day you, you're, you're becoming harder because it's more likely that you've lost the person who knows that piece of critical information or they slept right. and had a, they had a, they had a, you know, an IT nightmare. Uh, they woke up that morning and they forgot, you know, that they, they, you know, put their SSH key on a server to enable access until, until a year later when the machine's destroyed. Um, yeah, yep. that's, yep. that's um, all, all very true. Yeah. So we have those horror stories uh, for this. Um, you talked about Javin's paradox briefly. If, if people don't know what it is, um, that you should. <laughs> you should. Yeah. If you're in cloud and don't understand this, then you should. You want to define it very briefly, and then and then. Yeah, I'll, I'll define it very briefly and just say, you know, take take the five minutes after my dis, my short uh, uh, description. Take the five minutes and go. Um, read it on Wikipedia. Uh, Jevons is without an apostrophe. That is his name, J-E-V-O-N-S, and it's paradox. And um, Jevons was a scientist, I think it was the 1850s or 60s in England, and he did a study on coal. And to, you know, long story short, basically what he found was that when the ease of acquiring coal and the associated cost of, of buying that coal both went down, People didn't just save money, they in fact bought a lot more coal. And not just like 10% or 20% more, but by double or quadruple the coal they were buying before. And some of the reasons for that, and I'll get to why that relates to IT in a second, but some of the reasons for that are you think about if coal costs a certain amount of money and I need a certain number of customers in my metal shop during the day to keep my fire burning with coal in order to work on their metal products, and those customers drop off at four or five in the afternoon, um, then I can't afford to keep the coal fire burning when I don't have enough customers. What happens when the cost of coal goes down by 50 or 60%? Maybe I can stay up until seven or eight. Maybe I can stay up until nine. Now all of a sudden I'm burning more coal, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the IT world is no different. Uh, and in fact, there are any number of um, changes that have occurred in the IT world since the beginning of the mainframe, to mainframe, to minis, to minis, to towers, to towers, to, to pizza boxes, to pizza boxes, to blades, to blades, to VMs, to VMs, to containers, that are all indicative of what Jevons hypothesized uh, in the 1800s, and that is that when you make something more easily consumable and more cost-effective, people don't just buy what they used to and save money, they in fact find more ways to use it. And um, I think uh, certainly a major theme of what I wrote is, and um, what we're seeing is just that in the industry, that um, if, if Jevons' paradox hadn't been in play, then um, we should probably only have about 20 or 30% of the infrastructure we did in 2007 when VMware first really started hitting this, the, um, the planet. But instead, we've gone from you know, less than uh, 100 million servers, probably 60 or 70 million servers in 2007 around the world to somewhere between 150 and 200 million servers around the world today. Physical servers, not just VMs. So. I think that's a strong indicator of how Jevons is likely to play out for us in coming years. I, and I think that that effect is easy to underestimate that, right? Cause you started this, you know, putting a, a bow on it and bringing it all the way full circle. You started off saying, look, this is about customer experience yep. and enhancing customer experience. And if we make it easier, not just to buy, but to use. And, and to me, the, the, the bottleneck here is not acquisition cost. It's, it's operational cost. It's, right. it's how hard it is to put that, you know, MIP into productive use. Um, and if, if we can change the dynamics on it, and I know we can because Amazon and Google have, and yep. it's, it's the genie is out of the bottle, right, from yep. their efficiency will translate. That's Racken's job in some ways, right, 
uh, is to translate their efficiencies back into something that's consumable for everybody and then force them to figure out something else. Um, that, that cycle will, you know, it's, an, it's really an exponential cycle to, to an extent with IT. Um, oh, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I like to describe the idea that, um, you know, when I was talking about uh, how organizations are likely to turn into large or IT organizations, similar to a PayPal, which in the past, you could argue that PayPal was a bank. You know, PayPal's a bank, only instead of having, you know, 10,000 tellers across the country, they've got 100 sysadmins, right? Um, and, and they're delivering code. Uh, as tellers and 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 bank account information, et cetera, et cetera, transaction information. So when you take that and and you and you try to define that across the average enterprise today, the average enterprise spends probably two to five percent of their IT internal IT spend, not engineering on a physical product that they build, but internal IT spend. Two to three, two two to five percent of that is spent on the external customer, and that's on a website. Maybe it's some connections to partners, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but it is very, very small amount of their overall IT spend is spent on the external customer. So if what we're saying relative to Jevons paradox and customer being more cozy with the customer, knowing the customer more as being a major theme of much of the technology that's being deployed these days and, and developed in earnest, then what's that likely to mean? Well, that, what that's likely to mean is that more of our companies will be having regular conversations or interactions, whether they be transparent to the customer or directly involving the customer on a daily basis. So the average um, enterprise, let's say the average company has a thousand employees, I would argue that if we went across the world and we found uh, if every company had a thousand employees, that each one of those companies probably had three or four exponentials of, at minimum, of external customers. So even if those external customers were using 1% of the IT demand that the internal customer of that company would use, meaning the employee of that customer, that's still an incredible impact on the overall IT load. And so not only does that point to um, the potential growth in the environment, but it goes back to what we were talking about, about the fact that we won't be able to just throw more hardwares and hardware and bodies at this problem. Right. I think, I think that's a, a big deal. The, there's, there's sort of two pieces where I'm, I'm going to try and stitch them together and, and then throw you under the bus for a complex answer. All right. Morning in advance. Um, so, so interestingly to me, the 17% number that you gave um, is under sort of 20% is like a, 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 the sort of tipping point where things sort of run all the way one way. Not crossing that 20% threshold is, you know, it's actually a pretty significant miss, milestone miss. Um, and, and that brings up to me this getting closer to the customer, you know, edge. Um, Michael Dell the other day was in the Wall Street Journal saying edge is going to be 100 times bigger than public cloud. Um, I want to give you a layup on that one. Can you connect these? Sir? Yeah, let me see if I can. I mean, first, I, um, I mean, Michael Dell's a really smart guy. So who am I to argue with the point he made? Um, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, and I would say that I don't think it's going to be, I mean, that, that's a great number and it's exciting. Um, and is there a possibility that the edge will become over time larger than the public cloud itself? Maybe. But I think we're missing the point that um, much of the edge will actually be public cloud. And I think we're also missing the point that um, not, not all functions, because they happen at the edge, necessarily need to be computed or executed at the edge. And um, as, as a global IT organization, we'll need to continue to get much better at, at how we provide hierarchy to where data goes, where data is saved, how the networks are used, et cetera. We have, we have some complex problems to solve over the next five to six years, seven years, that companies like Netflix have been working on for years and struggling with as far as the up and down flow of providing localized services, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and how that affects you know, their ability to provide a consistent um, level of customer satisfaction over the network. And so that will be a big play. But the assumption many people, and I, I don't wanna say that Michael Dell was making this assumption, but the assumption that many people are making about the edge is that there'll be a million things we do at the edge that require sub five millisecond latency in order to be effective. And I would argue that um, by and large, that's not true, that there will be some, I'm sure we'll define some 
uh, work that will require five or less milliseconds in order to be successful. Um, but generically speaking, it takes roughly 300 milliseconds from the point you see that you need to stop your car to the point you put your foot on the brake. Um, so if the car can respond in five to 10 milliseconds, even to that kind of critical response, that's already incredibly, an incredible improvement over what was there before. The idea that we need to be able to get that fast at almost anything um, at the remote locations is, is I think, um, unlikely to be the case. But I do believe that smarter ability to dictate what work gets done locally and what data gets moved remote um, will be important to our ability to plan networks and plan power and plan um, uh, work activity from a compute standpoint. I, I think that's a good way to think about it. I would, I would go back to Jevons paradox and say, I don't think we even understand yet what real applications people are going to, are going to apply. I, I think. Well, yeah. I can't argue with that. Yeah. Yeah. And a, 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 AR, um, the augmented reality, um, sensor networks, um, those things, um, well, VR. AI, AI in at the edge, um, yeah. things like that video analytics, um, Right, the ability to use uh, vision as a, as a generic sensor, um, we're only at the beginning of some of these waves and it only takes one breakthrough of somebody really getting good at, you know, we're already close on on-demand on visual analytics um, to completely change, right, right, how, you know, these things. And so it's, it's really hard to predict um, I do think we can safely predict we have to have agility. We have to have highly automated infrastructure. Um, we're going to go back to, uh, and, uh, and, almost, and, also, and also wrap up on this, this point. The, the problem here is not the tech, right? Yeah. The problem is not the silicon. The problem is the people. And, and you and I talked a little before, the, before we started uh, recording about, about that. Do you want to sort of wrap up on, on that part of this dilemma? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, companies, we, we need to, um, as, as company um, directors, uh, as people of influence in, in how people get hired and how their careers develop, et cetera, I think um, as a global population, we, we need to do a much better job of owning responsibility for the sustainability of our companies as it relates to people, right? Um, I've been a proponent of sustainability for a long time and I've always been quoted as including the human equation as part of that sustainability. And I think now is uh, more important than ever for us to consider that and to realize that with the uh, more dynamic nature uh, of change and that change becoming more dynamic uh, uh, and rapid uh, every single year effectively, um, I think we have no choice but to put uh, processes and plans and strategy in place for helping the community grow the people that we would want to hire and for helping the people that we hire maintain uh, a successful work environment and a successful skill set for a period of time. I don't think we can afford as a group to continue to think of people as chattel. I, I just don't think it's, it'll be a successful model. It, it, truthfully, I've never thought that was a successful model. But I think that, that with the, um, the risks and overhead associated with what we've been talking about impacting organizations going forward, that the biggest potential gap in our ability to be successful is being able to hire and keep the right people for these new jobs. And so I think that this is a fundamental aspect uh, of our sustainability is getting better at working with the community, at working with the colleges, uh, at working with different organizations like STEM, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and working within your own organizations to put people in a position to be successful for a longer career than, um, than, than the life cycle of a particular programming language. Right. I think that's a very good point. I, I think there's a, there's a cost in, associated with this that, that I see a lot in open source communities understanding this cost of slowing down, communicating, and collaborating. Um, and what you're describing to me means that companies have to get better at widening their web of collaboration internally and externally um, 
and being willing to, to, to sort of reach out and say, all right, we're not, we don't want to invent the wheel here. We're, we need to collaborate. We need to reuse some practices. We need to help our people get trained and educated so that they don't run out and, and in urgency to solve problems, create more technical debt. That's right. Legacies. Um, and it's, it's a, to me, that change and the change you're describing are linked, right? Because you have to okay. say, all right, I'm going to hire somebody who doesn't understand how to program in the language I want or has never been a sysop before um, right. to do that job and train them and let, you know, not worry about, you know, going as fast as I possibly can and having them work 80 hours a week because what I really want them to do is create a sustainable, stable process. Right. Um, and there's a, it's a, it's a, it's an efficiency paradox with this. Um, and it's interesting. Um, I'm going to go all the way down in the, in the rabbit hole for a second because I've been, been, um, talking about efficiency thinking is potentially being, uh, I'm going to use the big word racist, um, for this. Um, mm -hmm. if you don't buy that, don't, you don't have to, uh, if you're a listener, um, it, it's this idea that efficiency thinking is not the only right answer for thinking. Um, and if that doesn't put you on your head, then nothing will. So you have right. to realize that, that adding efficiency as being your only goal, and I think, this, Mark, this is where you and I are highly aligned in this, this thinking, efficiency thinking being your only goal is actually undermining the efficiency of the whole system, right? No, it um, is. It is. I mean, I've, I've actually had this argument with, I mean, I know you and I have had this discussion uh, as well, but I've had this argument with other folks um, where when looking to find a way to measure something to the nth degree distracts from your vision as to where you should be tomorrow, uh, all of a sudden your efficiency efforts uh, have a multiplying effect to the negative potentially, right? And so it uh, this this is I agree with you 100%. This is an area of opportunity that we need to be more cognizant of, and there's a lot of different ways to 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 peel that onion and talk about it. But uh, you know, simply put, hire focus on hiring the people that can make the most value for you, and then focusing on partnering or using um, services that are best at at recruiting, building, and maintaining the other talent uh, instead of trying to um, use a shotgun approach or use a, um, you know, a, a waste your quiver of arrows in trying to hire a little bit of everything. Hire those data scientists, hire those AI folks that you really need, hire the, the primo coder for a specific function that you need, but don't um, put yourself in a position where you're trying to compete with the likes of, um, of Amazon and Facebook for a specific set of coders um, if you don't have to. Yeah. That's very well said. Wow, we went we went super deep at the end. I love it. Um, Mark, how can people find you? I, I know you're on CIO chat all the time. It's how I usually I, yeah, I'm amplify on, you, but, but yep. what's, what's going on? What's the best way? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter on a regular basis uh, as mtle10, M-T-H-I-E-L-E-1-0. -E um, you can, of course, you can find me on LinkedIn under Mark Teeley. Uh, I, I, I am semi-regularly posting blogs there. You can also find blogs uh, um, posted on my company site uh, under appsera.com slash blogs. Um, I work for Appsera. Uh, I'm very public. I tend to be out um, speaking and, and working in different activities. Um, I'm a participant in Cloud Minds occasionally, as you are. I am um, also... Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm also the active um, uh, technical committee chairman for IDCA. Um, and a lot of the work we're doing aligns with uh, our discussion today uh, very closely. Excellent. Excellent. Mark, thank you. I appreciate the time. It's been a really remarkable conversation. We covered a lot of ground. So Yes, no, it was, it was good fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mark.